Happy bells across the snow. The year is going. Let him go. Ring out the false. Ring in the true. January 1st marks the anniversary of resolutions made last year and in years past on the bright first page of a new calendar. Resolutions, hopes, crisp new dreams for the year ahead, and its gift of achievement, the goals of people and of nations. In our time, man leaping from first to twelfth month as though with seven league boots, time even as distances shrinking before the ever quickening tide of progress. January 1st raises the curtain on each year's new calendar. The system of dividing and recording time dating back to the ancient peoples is considered by many to be the first great achievement of the human mind. Calendar art has changed with the modes and moods of the eras. And the lighter side of New Year's. What has it been like on our contemporary scene? In the news film almanac of this day, these are among the reflections and images. One thing is certain, the years roll on, but the celebrants and the enthusiasm of their celebrations are basically the same. A nose count in New York's Times Square long ago revealed that for each welcomer who discards this annual demonstration, another is there to take his place. This could be today as well as yesterday when Old Lang Syne replaced Old Man Blues and the happy first page of the brand new calendar danced before the eyes. The night was long, and there in the realm of dreams was Father Time, a rich old gentleman, no doubt, or how else could he afford to winter where it's warm? Goodbye, sir. Hello, young man. The happiest sounds of the happy new year. Bruno Richard Hauptmann, his name repeated everywhere. Flemington, New Jersey, it became an internationally known dateline. January 2nd, 1935, when the stolid Bronx carpenter went before court and jury for the kidnapping and murder of Charles A. Lindbergh, Jr. From the hour the baby was taken from its crib on the night of March 1st, 1932, the grim hunt made headlines, leading finally to the paroled German convict who had entered the U.S. unlawfully nine years before and who was arrested after he had passed a ransom banknote at a gasoline filling station. The most elaborate press coverage in history, there were 400 newspaper men, detailed the discovery of ransom money in Hauptmann's garage, wrote of the truckloads of exhibits and documentary evidence. Millions of words poured out. In one of the most gripping court duels, Attorney General David T. Willens subjected the accused man to a relentless grilling which held the spectators, jury, and newsmen spellbound. The great criminal trial ran through more than 40 dramatic days, during which many damaging fingers pointed at Hauptmann, and the evidence piled up against him, though he had denied his guilt under oath. All important was the alleged kidnap ladder. Part of it was sworn to have come from Hauptmann's attic. Uh, did you make the 
designs of drawing up a machine up in Germany? No. None at all? None at all. No blueprints? No. No blueprints. Do you remember the circles in the coop? The symbol in the coop company? The three interlocking circles? Uh, I saw it. But at any rate, when you first went into the market, you wanted to do it. And you never built a ladder, that's sure. If you did build a ladder, the first one wouldn't be so good, would it? I guess the first one must be very really good. Then this sensational moment. Stop, stop. Didn't you swear to one truth in the Bronx courthouse? Stop, stop. Didn't you put it on truth at the bar? Didn't you lie on the road? Time and time again, didn't you? I did not. You did not? No. All right. When you were arrested with this Lindbergh ransom money, you had a $20 bill. Lindbergh ransom money, did they ask you where it was? Did they ask you? They did. Did you lie over it? Did you tell them the truth? Did you lie to them or did you tell them the truth? I said nothing to them. You lied, didn't you? I did, yes. Yeah. The jury convicted Hauptmann. The State Board of Pardons refused to commute his sentence and the United States Supreme Court also would not interfere. Little more than a year following the end of the trial, he was executed. <music> History turned another corner at 12.02 Washington time when the President of the United States on January 3rd, 1959, signed and dated the proclamation formally declaring Alaska a state of the Union, the 49th state. The last previous admission of a state and change of the flag design took place in 1912 when Arizona became the 48th state. Now it was Alaska, adding the 49th star to a redesigned old glory. Alaska, the nation's largest state, with an area one-fifth as large as the rest of the United States. Alaska, the last frontier with vast untapped regions. Land of contrasts, one-third lying within the Arctic Circle and of wide temperature range. They called it 590,000 square miles of icebergs and polar bears when Secretary of State Seward purchased the territory from the Tsar for about seven millions in 1867. Its wealth in the gold that was screened and panned from gravel by prospectors was but the meager beginning. Huge mining dredges were to handle millions of tons of earth and from the minerals and fish and furs were to come repayment of the purchase price hundreds and hundreds of times over. History has recorded how uninformed were those Americans who thought Alaska was worthless, who termed it Seward's Folly or Seward's Frog Pond, a treasure chest of natural resources where new wealth is constantly found. That is Alaska, the 49th state of the Union. How memorable were these scenes at Anchorage, largest city, when congressional approval at last ended the fight for statehood. Alaskans celebrated while historians duly noted the day in June, six months before the presidential proclamation. Wild rejoicing in Anchorage as a flag 60 by 40 feet received its huge glittering 49th star on the field of blue. A 42 year campaign in the halls of Congress had brought statehood. What of the flag makers? Old Glory's new face had hardly been applied when it became apparent that soon there would be a 50th star, Hawaii's. But Alaska was first, and the flag was to be unfurled on July the 4th, symbolizing final vindication of Secretary Seward and reminding all of the anniversary of Alaska's formal proclamation of statehood, which we mark today. Alaska's people are young. Their average age is 26, five years below that for the rest of the U.S. It is a well-educated population, distinctly American in loyalty and culture. Migrants from the continental United States, or Eskimos, Aleut, and Alaskan Indians, they're all Yankee Doodle nephews. Wherever man walks in this world, there he will find the blind for whom night has no end, and the Iron Curtain is the darkness which shrouds their eyes. Theirs is the universal language of Braille. For centuries, charity and alms were reserved for the blind, 
the human mind was slow to grasp that they could and should read and that they deserved education. Today, Braille printing presses produce vast quantities of embossed books and periodicals for a system of touch reading in use practically throughout the civilized world. In a technical sense, Braille is a code system utilizing one or more raised dots in various positions with a so-called Braille cell. Spiritually, for upwards of six and a half million blind, it is the work of the Apostle of Light, Louis Braille, born January 4th, 1809. Blinded accidentally as a child, at age 15, he invented his alphabet, which led the blind out of darkness. Reading fingers, writing responsive to the touch of the blind, born from the wonderful six-dot system by which the Frenchman Louis Braille became known as one of the world's great benefactors. In recent years, UNESCO has provided the initiative for extending the Braille system even to African dialects and to Oriental languages. The inventions and devices applied to the system are likewise as varied as the progress of our times. No longer shut up in a dark closet, their existence is now brightened through participation in the communication, education, and recreation which make up the modern world. Again, thanks to the matchless contribution to intellectual advancement made by Louis Braille. As early as 1828, he applied his system to music notation, which is now adapted to universal usages. In writing notes, he simply assigned a symbol to each octave. Great inspirational impetus for the world's blind is provided by the renowned Helen Keller. Deaf as well as blind, she's devoted her life as traveler, lecturer, and writer to promote better care for the sightless. The sense of touch, it is the secret, the beginning and the destiny, and surely the means for happiness for all who are deprived of the light of the universe. Educators of the blind, in addition to touch reading, today have talking books at their disposal. Through an amendment to the U.S. postal laws, libraries send Braille and talking books through the mail free of charge. Braille readers can attain an average speed of 100 words a minute. But statistics would be as nothing were it not for the spirit of the blind, who take refuge in the light of their belief in themselves. Louis Braille would be proud of the heritage of faith he left to them. Here we mark an anniversary which automobile owners in 1942 recall so vividly. For to most, it was the end of pleasure driving for the duration of World War II. Traffic, why the highways and streets were roots of emptiness. The great conflict of survival being fought overseas put every American on the front line. By January 5th, 1942, consumer rationing had begun, and first to be rationed were tires. Other commodities followed with supplies placed under government control and sales made only to those persons directly aiding the war effort. The home front became as vital as the battlefront. For the American housewife, it became a time of intelligent adjustment. Sugar and coffee, and then many other kinds of foods were added to the growing list of rationed items. Rationed books were issued, and women became familiar with the point system for buying the necessary staples for their tables. The government was doing everything possible to secure a fair distribution of the goods that were available. Even as mechanized warfare demanded gasoline and tires, so did the troops require fuel, food, which keeps the human machinery functioning. An army still traveled on its stomach. That remained the fundamental logistics of soldiering. So back home, those who kept war plants humming, the industrial output at all out levels, also kept faith with the boys at the front by tightening their belts by refusing to play ball with black marketeers, by acknowledging the signs of the times, highlighted by an awareness of food scarcities, which actually never became really serious. For when certain items were in short supply, substitutes were accepted. To pay more than ceiling prices was an act short of treason for the housewife loyal to the boys fighting democracy's battle. Shortages, particularly in food, appear alarming. But you younger people watching this show, ask your moms and dads, 
they'll recall that the neighborhood grocer was mostly the same friendly man beset with problems of pleasing his customers while conforming to the letter of government controls. There were the greedy who sought to make under-the-counter deals, but once found out, they faced the penalties of the law and the indignation of public-spirited citizens. Happily, most Americans remained loyal. We won the war because pledges such as this did not go unnoticed. This was a symbol of total war on the home front. We fed our troops and the starving pawns of war overseas, and still we were the land of plenty. Consumer rationing helped, so it is indeed a notable anniversary we marked today. Theodore Roosevelt, 26th President of the United States, 1901 to 1909. We mark the anniversary of his passing from the earthly scene, January 6, 1919. His summer White House was Sagamore Hill on New York's Long Island, just east of Oyster Bay. It was here that he was buried. Today, the site is preserved as a shrine to his memory. It is historic, too, that the newsreel camera was present to record the solemn event for posterity. For in Teddy Roosevelt's time, news film was beginning its enduring record of events and the people who inscribed their names in the chronicle of the era. Wherever free men gathered, there were those who mourned the dynamic, colorful TR who dominated American life in the first decade of the 20th century. Teddy Roosevelt was a colonel in the Rough Riders, famed cavalry regiment of the Spanish-American War. Long Island polo players and western cowhands rode with him in the charge at San Juan Hill. He enjoyed the wide open spaces, and he rode herd on New York politics, becoming the state's governor in 1898. Treasured cameos recall vividly in action shots the life and times of this advocate of the strenuous life. A man of many interests who made so many phrases popular, trust busting, muck rakers, speak softly and carry a big stick. My hat is in the ring. He was renowned for his capacity for leadership and willingness to take the initiative. In this compilation of T.R. the Man, we find the portraits varied and interesting. He had an enduring concern for the young with four sons of his own. T.R. had become vice president as McKinley's running mate in the campaign of 1900. And upon the president's assassination, at 42 was the youngest man ever to occupy the executive mansion. Before his administration had run its course, the construction of the Panama Canal had begun. A sound program of conservation developed. The Wright brothers had flown. The first Model T automobile was on the market. T.R.'s years left their mark on our time. His name is forever identified with the growth and expansion of the American Navy. Beginning in 1922 and until 1948, Navy Day was set apart each year to honor T.R. as father of the modern American Navy. His first association with the fleet was as Assistant Secretary of the Navy in 1897. The man who affectionately was called Teddy by millions of people he was one of the country's great presidents. The anniversary we mark is one of Justice and Thomas J. Mooney, labor leader convicted on testimony later proved to be faked. Shown here with his wife and mother, just brief years after he was charged with another man of having perpetrated a fatal bombing at the San Francisco Preparedness Day Parade of July 22, 1916. For two decades, family and friends strove to confirm his innocence. Here, he's with an historic photograph enlarged for defense evidence. It shows Mooney watching the parade from a roof, a clock in the background indicating he was a mile from the explosion when it occurred. One picture worth a man's life. The gates of San Quentin opened for Tom Mooney on January 7, 1939. At long last, he breathed the fresh air of freedom. 
More than 22 years, beginning with President Wilson's intervention in his behalf, when death by hanging seemed imminent. Mooney became an international cause celeb. People everywhere joined his loved ones with whom he is now reunited in repeated efforts to have the case reopened. All that was had ended. At the California Capitol, the most famous prisoner in the U.S. received the unconditional pardon granted by Governor Colbert L. Olson. Mooney was now 55 years old, his health impaired, but his joy unrestrained. Um, here's your full and unconditional pardon, signed and sealed by Honorable Colbert L. Olson, Governor of the great state of California. My heart is filled with gratitude upon this occasion, and it's difficult for me to express in simple words the emotions that are surging within me over the climax of this struggle, which has culminated here in the issuing of this pardon. And I want to thank Colbert Olson and through him all of the good people of California who has made it possible for him to become the chief executive of this state and their chief magistrate, and to also make it possible for him to right this monstrous wrong that has blurred the escutcheons of the state of California for almost a quarter of a century. For an unconditional pardon. Get that. <laughs> Next day, a labor parade, an hour of triumph. Tom Mooney in the lead. The same route on Market Street, the same landmarks famous now in the annals of justice to be recalled on this anniversary and on the day just three years after his release from prison when Tom Mooney died. But he had lived to enjoy this great moment of a troubled life. This is the happiest day of my life. Castro, in our time the newest strongman of Cuba and reportedly anti-American, fanning fires of discord and prompting observers to wonder whether force alone could be Cuba's final destiny. Castro began his campaign in Sierra Maestre, the mountains of eastern Cuba, where he made it with a small band of youthful survivors after landing on the western coast of Oriente province near year-end in 1956. The Batista government had proclaimed and believed Castro to be dead. Tall and powerfully built, he set an example for his followers by letting his hair and beard grow during a two-year campaign in the mountains. Likewise, his invasion force of peasants and students grew, soon to move to the foothills and decisive battle. Castro was ready to smash the Batista dictatorship. Fidel Castro was a non-practicing lawyer who started his career of fighting Batista in 1953 when he led a desperate quixotic attack on the Moncada barracks in Santiago on July 26th, which was to give a name to the movement he would lead to victory in Havana January 8th, 1959. Havana celebrated. Prisons were emptied of hundreds of political prisoners. An island of six and a half million with a yearly national income exceeding two billions from sugar, cattle, tobacco, minerals, and tourists had fallen to 32-year-old Fidel Castro and an army so very strange to the mid-20th century. Small wonder that calmer observers were already pondering whether would Cuba drift under revolutionaries spawned from seeds of uncertainty and with beliefs which would prove so alien to democracy. But this was the hour for history, Castro's hour and the sights and scenes unfolded with intense drama. There he was, Castro. The adulation of the crowds was his, a picture to be remembered. For many, it was the first time they had heard his voice, loudly eloquent, charged with the heat of conquest. Los que creyeron que después de nuestras victorias militares, nos iban a aplastar en el campo de la información, nos iban a aplastar en el campo de la opinión pública, se han encontrado con que la revolución cubana sabe también pelear y ganar batallas en este campo.
This, then, was Fidel Castro's Cuban conquest, marking the anniversary in the Almanac newsreel of today. General Douglas MacArthur, hero of Bataan, liberator of the Philippines in World War II. In January 45, he was making good his promise to avenge the rout of his forces on the Philippines in the first weeks following Pearl Harbor. In Australia in 44, MacArthur's words had made history. Two years ago, when I landed on your soil, I said to the people of the Philippines whence I came, I shall return. Tonight, I repeat those words. I shall return. Here was the beginning of the decisive battle for the liberation of the Philippines. Naval forces of the 7th Fleet and GIs of the 6th Army with General MacArthur in personal command. The communique read, in a far-flung amphibious penetration, our troops have seized four beachheads in Lingayen Gulf. The movement was covered by a blistering naval and air bombardment. The beaches were hit commencing at 9.30 a.m. January 9, 1945, on the island of Luzon largest and most important of the Philippines. The element of strategic surprise caught the enemy unprepared. Our losses were slight. Twenty-four hours after the invasion, American troops had linked all four beachheads and were advancing inland. The airfield was seized, the enemy's main reinforcement and supply lines had been cut, and Manila was only about 110 miles east-southeast of the beachheads. Scenes of liberation were everywhere. In the matter of geographic size, Luzon's area could be compared with that of Kentucky's. Everywhere on the islands, the operation of our troops owed their success in a large measure to the underground work of Philippine guerrilla forces. Three and a half years the Japanese had occupied Luzon. Our flag was now beginning to fly again over the islands, a gratifying hour indeed for General MacArthur, who was to send the word back home, we shall not rest until the enemy is completely overthrown. He came to congratulate typical Yanks on the firing line, boys from Main Street, from the farm, from school or factory. Probably just average they were, but what a job they did helping fulfill the promise, I shall return. Aboard this freighter, wallowing helplessly in the stormy sea off the coast of England, was Captain Courageous himself, Henrik Kurt Carlson, the skipper who refused to leave his ship, the Flying Enterprise, which cracked during an Atlantic hurricane and began to list. Captain Carlson ordered all aboard to abandon ship. He stayed aboard, unseen, but not unsung by the admiring world. Starting before New Year's into the first week of January 1952, headlines told of his ordeal by wind and wave, of the tug turmoil which took the Enterprise in tow after getting its first mate aboard to join Captain Carlson, and the U.S. destroyer Weeks, which earlier brought food, even something to read. Towering seas running downwind, making the target difficult, but the line fired with accurate aim to the intrepid mariner waiting at the rolling rail aboard the Enterprise. Only 35 miles from Safe Harbor, the tow line had snapped. Angry waves doomed the Enterprise. Captain Carlson's picture flashed across the front pages, even as his parents were flown into England from their home in Denmark to be at the side of their heroic son, who at last had leaped into the sea and was picked up by a rescue vessel. But the saga of Carlson's ship had not ended. Cargo ripped from her holds was scattered like bouncing corks, a million dollars worth, mostly irreplaceable art objects. On January 10th, the Enterprise was dealt its finishing blows. 
Stern first, she started her last voyage, alone to the bottom of the Atlantic. On land and sea, admiration followed the great struggle that was ended now as the 6,700-ton freighter disappeared. Then the world could look upon the face of Captain Carlson, welcomed at the English port of Falmouth. The Danish-born American citizen, 37 years old, was knighted by the King of Denmark, received a New York ticker tape reception. But this hour, following his rescue, was perhaps the most cherished. His parents at his side, he talked of the memorable chapter. With our life jackets on, we jumped from the smokestack into the sea and swam toward the... Uh... Uh, Talkboat turmoil where the crew was ready to pick us up and uh, in less than nine minutes we were brought in the uh, turmoil where we were handed some warm tea and rum, some warm clothes and then we had a very welcome rest. What course. are you going to do now? I'm going to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you very much. Amelia Earhart. She belonged to the lonesome greats of the late 20s and 30s who dominated flying before the days of jets and rocket power. She held many historic firsts. First woman to cross the Atlantic by plane. First woman to fly that ocean alone. First to make a solo flight across the continent. And first of her sex to fly an autogyro. On January 11, 1935, she took off from Honolulu for the first trans-Pacific aerial venture ever made by a woman. This was the log of that memorable flight as Amelia Earhart's monoplane carried her over the Pacific alone, as she'd been flying since winning her wings in 1918 at age 20. Long hours aloft, she radioed, am becoming quite tired. She next reported a fog pocket. The cruising speed of her ship was 160 miles per hour. Three quarters of a day in the lonely sky, and the 2,400-mile flight had become history. Amelia Earhart had added another ocean to her record of memorable firsts. There were 10,000 waiting at the field in Oakland, California. At this point in the young aviation industry, only one other eastward hop had been made over the Hawaii-U.S. route. So you can picture the nation's enthusiasm at this completion by a member of the opposite sex. The Atlantic flight, I had ice conditions and general storm. On this flight, really no bad weather at all except a few little rain squalls. I saw the moon and stars most of the night. Of course, in both flights, I was very glad to Land. She did not rest on her laurels, this winner of the Distinguished Flying Cross. By 1937, had her sights on a round-the-world flight. A crew of three helped plan the venture, but delay caused by damage to the plane during takeoff left Miss Earhart with only one crewman not tied to previous commitments. He was Captain Fred Noonan. Miss Earhart had said, I'm going to fly around the globe as near to the equator as I can make it. An SOS during what was almost the last lap of the flight alerted the nation and its air and sea forces. Amelia Earhart was lost, somewhere between takeoff from New Guinea and a central Pacific island. The long, desperate search was futile. Earhart and navigator Fred Noonan were never heard from again. Commencing January 12, 1952, record rain and snowstorms swept California and Nevada. In Southern California, hillside homes were half buried in landslides loosened by unprecedented eight-inch downpours. A flood of mud engulfed cars. In Northern California, the storms brought snow instead of rain. 
marooning travelers and challenging the biggest plows to break their way through so traffic could move again. Portola in the Sierra Nevadas was reported buried under nine feet of snow. Everywhere it became a grim battle against the elements, a matter of life and death for many isolated communities. The rest of the nation, the East basking in mild weather, read news stories and viewed news film, which spelled out the scenes of incredible heavy snows out west. Drifts as deep as 50 feet were reported in many places. But no matter how many means of transport were bogged down, the old adage, the mail must go through, was again given vivid portrayal. It was at blizzard-swept Donner Pass, 7,200-foot summit of the Sierra Nevadas, that a great drama was enacted. A 15-car train, the Southern Pacific's luxury streamliner, City of San Francisco, snowbound with 232 passengers aboard. The train was almost completely buried. It was without heat or light. Down the mountain, rescue operations went into high gear. A tense day and night passed, and then another. Snow plows fought their way up the engulfed right-of-way, battling and drilling through 25-foot drifts. At last, a 17-car relief train reached the beleaguered streamliner, bringing food, warm clothing, medical supplies, nurses, and doctors. The marooned passengers brought down the mountain slopes by rescue squads were waiting for them. Most of the passengers reported they had weathered a three-day ordeal in the stalled train without undue discomfort, although a number were overcome by gas, which seeped through the train's ventilation system. It was recalled that this was nearly the exact site of a tragedy of pioneer days. The Donner Party perished in just such a storm, trying to make their way to California in 1846. But the great blizzard of 1952 had a more fortunate ending. The Tsar also called the Saar Territory, or Saar Basin, is rich in history and its coal mines and steel foundries. For more than a thousand years, France and Germany have struggled for control here. Today, its future is tied to the goals of democracy and a free Western Germany. But we are looking back to the period following World War I, when it was placed under League of Nations control for 15 years and the days that rocked the Tsar land and again interrupted the complacency of a people who, through wars and peace, had been touched by imperialism. From the Tsar's Franco-German frontier to jam-packed streets, shouting voices of political agitation, this rally of the German front, led by pro-Hitler National Socialists, occurred short weeks before a plebiscite for Saarlanders to indicate by whom they wished to be governed. The opposition to the rising tide of Hitlerism was the Liberty Front, admixture of peoples and philosophies, singular in its goal for halting the swastika short of the Tsar's 991 square miles. The plebiscite, set for January 13, 1935, was referred to by the Liberty Front as endangered by connivance among Nazis. Emblazoned on posters was, for Germany against Hitler, status quo, continued League of Nations administration. Voters in the plebiscite included some 55,000 Saarlanders who journeyed from the world over, eligible because they lived in the Saar in 1919 when the Treaty of Versailles became effective. They represented 10% of the total vote. Historians have noted that during the 18 hours the ballots were stored following the election of January 13, 1935, the National Socialists had access to them. 90 and 3 tenths percent declared for union with Hitler's Germany. News film recorded the departure of the League of Nations International Military Police Force, which was sent in to preserve order during the plebiscite period. They had been hailed as friendly invaders, 
but apparently they were powerless to uncover or halt pressures which the Nazis exercised to influence the vote. Such were the scenes as Europe marked time in that brief period of years before war erupted again upon its troubled sea. In March of 1935, the Saar territory was turned over to the Third Reich. The credulous population responded as though it had forgotten its past history. Fortified by Hitler as part of the Siegfried Line, the area was severely bombed in World War II. Again, the Saar became a pawn of war. This is the birth anniversary of a truly great man who has based his philosophy on what he termed reverence for life. Albert Schweitzer, born January 14, 1875 in Alsace. Rarely has a generation given to the world a man of such many-sided genius philosopher, physician, musician, clergyman, missionary, and writer on theology. Schweitzer's humanitarian work won him the 1952 Nobel Peace Prize. At age 21, he had set for himself a nine-year plan unmatched for cultural and religious pursuits. He won his doctorate of philosophy at 24. He became a gifted organist and authority on organ building, and his book on Johann Sebastian Bach brought him acclaim from highest musical circles. He has been called the world's foremost authority on the literary genius Johann Goethe. It is often repeated that Albert Schweitzer's achievement in any one field could be a full life's work for one man. For Schweitzer, another turning point came when he was already a world figure in theological studies and decided also to administer to the illnesses of the unfortunate. He studied medicine for seven years and in 1913 became a missionary doctor in French Equatorial Africa. Rarely photographed is the remote site of the Lamborghini Hospital at Gabon Province, where from humble beginnings, Dr. Schweitzer built a world-famed center for fighting disease. He is here shown when in 1950 he awaited the arrival of a French high commissioner who showed his country's admiration for the dedicated man who surmounted all difficulties to do battle against the scourges of leprosy, sleeping sickness, and a host of tropical diseases. His humane work was interrupted by war, but except for brief visits to the outside world, his life has been tied to his hospital. He found time to complete two volumes of a monumental work, The Philosophy of Civilization, and later to lecture and give recitals to gain additional funds for his medical projects. And there are legions of organizations and men of all lands who would do him honor. He has visited and been honored in France, Norway, Great Britain, the Netherlands, Scandinavia, and Germany. He visited the United States in 1949 as speaker and honored guest at the Goethe Bicentennial Convocation at Aspen, Colorado. This is the face, etched in character and exceptional physical strength, keys to Schweitzer's astounding capacity for a notable and crowded life which had reached beyond four score years. Mm -hmm.